Hello everyone, so I'm going to try not to speak too long, but there is a number of issues to cover in this one, so please bear with me. Um, we have a general election coming up in the UK, this is for my international viewers, on the 7th of May. That is to determine the next British government. Um, this has been a long parliament, usually it's uh, more like four, four and a half years, this one has been five years. So our last general election was in 2010 and uh, we had a coalition government between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats. The Conservative Party is centre-right, sometimes hard-right. The Liberal Democrats are centre-left. Uh, so these are the two, two politically opposing parties who made the decision, very controversial decision I might add, uh, to go into a coalition government. Um, the last five years have been dominated by a number of big issues, uh, very controversial austerity cuts, that has um, arguably made the country a lot more divided in terms of wealth and poverty. Um, so it's definitely, in my opinion, it has created more social inequality. We have a very serious situation now with a lot of people relying on food banks. There's genuine poverty in this country, and that's a disgraceful legacy of the Cameron years. Having said that, I try to be objective on these things, and I, I never completely dismiss a government as entirely good or entirely bad. So um, one of the more positive things, I guess you could say, if you're a liberal-minded person, would be the introduction of uh, uh, gay marriage, which has arguably made the United Kingdom the most forward-looking country in the world uh, in terms of gay rights. Um, in fact, there was a study done recently uh, that put the UK at number one. That surprised me. I thought, OK, it's going to be Sweden or Iceland or somewhere like that. We were number one in the world. Um, and that's certainly all British citizens should be proud of that fact and I think um, it will go down well in Cameron's legacy. Um, the preservation of the United Kingdom and that's going to be a big issue in this video that is uh, better together um, having victory in the Scottish referendum um, was an achievement but there still remains big divisions and those things cannot be overlooked. There's been other notable sort of non-political events London 2012 Olympics, the Royal Wedding, um, and of course we have the ongoing issue of Islamism in our society and a lot of young people becoming radicalised and going off to fight in Syria. These are all issues that have dominated the Cameron Clegg years. Um, we also, by the way, had serious inner city riots in England in 2011, um, but to blame that on uh, solely on the cuts I think would be misleading, I think it's a big part of it, but there's no excuse for burning someone from their home, none whatsoever. Um, there's other notable issues, uh, our military campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan have ended, um, very big cost of those campaigns and they remain controversial issues. But anyway, I'm just basically highlighting some of the notable events. Uh, tuition fees was another big one that really hammered the Lib Dems. A lot of students were very angry with Nick Clegg for his supposed betrayal. And uh, finally, the rise of UKIP. I would say those are all notable issues of the last five years. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but those are some that stick out. So, you would think that with all that's happened, there would be a lot of anticipation for this election. But to me, there's surprisingly not that much focus on it. Uh, and I'm not saying the BBC and other networks aren't covering it. They are, but... I mean, it just doesn't feel like we're less than two months away from a, a general election. It doesn't really... I'm not getting that feeling at this stage. And I'm not saying that... I'm not blaming anyone for that. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem to be that feeling. Um, the main issue at the moment is this TV debate. Um, and it seems to be a much bigger issue than actual policies, which is... You know, um, think what you want about that, but... Personally, I'm broadly in favour of televised prime ministerial debates. I think they went down well last time. I think they probably meant that the turnout in 2010 was higher than usual. Um, I did think they got a lot of interest. So that's bound to be a good thing. If the voters are engaging with the democratic process, that's bound to be a good thing. And certainly in the American model, I, I like the idea of it. There was a first debate, of course, between Nixon and Kennedy. Then there was a period of about 16 years gap. Then back to 76, uh, Carter Ford, and I think there's been pretty much debates ever since. I don't think there was a debate. No, uh, yeah, there's been a debate ever since. Um, 
and they've always uh, been quite significant and captivating in the American audience. So, um, the United Kingdom is actually quite late on this because a lot of other countries had presidential debates. Brazil does it, um, Italy does it, France does it. We're actually rather late in the game, so I think it's about time that we did. Um, and uh, the question is, to what extent can a, a leader's performance in a general election debate, televised debate, have on their performance in the polls? Well, certainly Nick Clegg's performance, he done very well. And in a period of one week, he went from being, oh, just the leader of the Lib Dems, to being, in some reports, the most popular party leader since Winston Churchill. Now, that was an incredible rise. Then what happened was when he got into government of the Tories, he went from being the most popular leader to being almost despised by a large uh, core of Lib Dem voters, especially students. They justifiably felt that they'd been betrayed because Clegg got up on a platform and says we will, said we will never raise tuition fees. Then in government, that's precisely what he'd done. Um, and I think all other politicians should take note from Nick Clegg's experience. Don't make promises you can't keep. I don't think voters would be so hard on Nick Clegg if he hadn't promised it. If he had said it is our policy to try and aim for this, to try and reduce tuition fees, um, and then they raise the tuition fees, people would still be angry, but I don't think the, the feelings would be quite so deep. It's a fact that he made it an absolute promise. So he was sort of um, committing suicide in that act, in a sense, politically speaking. So I do suspect this time the Lib Dems are going to be hit quite hard. Um, before I continue... I'm just going to read out the results of the top 10 parties just to give you a context of what happened in 2010. Um, and if my international viewers have any questions about what these parties mean, um, I will explain that. Conservatives. 10,703,654 votes. 306 MPs. Labour. 8,606,517 votes. 258 MPs. The Liberal Democrats, 6,836,248 votes, 57 MPs. And just to continue here. UKIP, 919,471 votes, no MPs. The BNP, 564,000 votes, 321. Uh, 564,321 votes, no MPs. The SNP, 491,386 votes, 6 MPs, but those MPs were in the Scottish Parliament. I don't think there were any actual seats up in the Scottish uh, Parliament. The Greens, 265,243 votes, 1 MP, and that is in uh, Brighton Pavilion. Sinn Féin, 171,942 votes, 5 MPs. That's members of the Northern Ireland Assembly. DUP, 168,216 votes, 8 MPs. Ply Comru, 165,394 votes, 3 MPs. The SDLP, 110,970 votes, 3 MPs. The Ulster Conservatives and Unionists, New Force, 102,361 votes. And then after that you get truly small parties like the English Democrats, Alliance, Respect, etc, etc. And there's a whole list of... The the party that performed least, and I don't know why I'm even mentioning them, but I'll mention them for a laugh, was the New Millennium Bean Party. Who got 558 votes. And without sounding smug, I personally got more votes than that than I ran for my local council. But then again, I personally got more votes in the gap between Bush and Gore in Florida in 2000, but that's not here or there. Um, okay, so, all joking aside, those are how many votes the party's got. The Tories had by far the most votes, but um, the the key in the UK is how many seats they get, and they got 306 seats, and I think the barometer to form a government, the sort of cut-off, where you have to get that many seats to form a government is 327. In other words, the Tories were short by that, by 21 seats. Um, don't quote me on that, it might be, uh, I think it's 327, in fact, I'm just checking now to make sure. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact figure, it's something like 327. So basically no party had overall control. 
And that's why coalition talks were necessary. There's a very interesting documentary online. It's called Five Days in May. And there's been several books about it as well, about those very intense talks between the Lib Dems and the Tories. A lot of Tories felt that um, it wasn't, uh, they didn't like the idea of giving senior positions to what they saw as a minor party. And the Lib Dems felt that they would be just like thrown around a bit and pushed around. But, you know, I, I think that this is basically um, democracy. The fact of democracy is people don't always like the decision, but democracy works through voters expressing what they want and the results and government formation is a reflection of what people want or what people have indicated that they are supporting. So when the other people uh, say the Lib Dems should feel ashamed for propping up the Tories, I would say, well, you have to respect democracy, whether we like it or not, and I'm not a fan of the Tories. There's been times I've outright hated some of their policies. But the fact of the matter is that is democracy. They got the most votes. Um, it's not like a military coup d'etat they just took over. They were democratically elected. That's just a fact. Um, and yes, I, I hate some of the things they've done. I hated some of their billboards, scapegoating the unemployed and so on. But anyway... Um, this is about this year. Um, so the main focus has been the fact that there's been seven parties invited to a televised debate. I have real issues about that because I don't think um, any of the smaller parties that have been invited, Ply Comru, the Greens, the SNP or even UKIP, have yet demonstrated that they deserve to be in with the big three parties. I would have probably three debates. I would have one between the three big parties because they are far bigger in terms of electoral percentage than any of the others. I'd have one debate like last time with them. I would have one debate inviting the Greens and UKIP because they're national parties. They've had a presence in all four home nations. And then a final debate in uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and maybe in England as well for the leaders. Um, but I think it is absurd that the SNP and Ply Comru can have a say in a national debate especially when the DUP are not invited, and the DUP got slightly more votes than Plaid Comru, um, they're, they're justified in feeling uh, grieved by that. And once again, Northern Ireland's overshadowed. Now, I'm not a DUP supporter, but I think their grievance is justified. You know, if, the, if Plaid Comru can be invited, why shouldn't they be invited? After all, Plaid Comru doesn't care what happens in England, Northern Ireland or Scotland. And likewise, the SNP doesn't care what happens in England, Scotland, uh, England Northern Ireland or Wales. Nationalist parties are only interested in the nation they claim to represent. So I think it's absurd giving them a platform in a debate that's about the whole nation. You can imagine the scenario if we have this situation where the SNP is in a televised national debate. A question comes up about foreign policy. Nicola Sturgeon's answer is Scotland, Scotland, Scotland. A question comes up about health. Nicola Sturgeon's answer is Scotland, Scotland, Scotland. She will focus entirely on Scotland and completely ignore the rest of the UK. And even if she tries to include England and so on to be diplomatic, you know she's a nationalist leader and she couldn't care less. Um, so I think it's just a messy situation to invite separatist parties into a national debate. Uh, the Greens and UKIP are a bit different because they are national parties in the sense that they have a presence nationwide. That's why I propose a second debate including them. But there should be one debate where it's just a liberal Labour, Conservative. I know you kept saying that they're the third party, but they're yet to really prove that. Granted, they've made a lot of progress in the last five years, I give them that, but based on those votes, they're still way, way, way behind the Liberal Democrats. It's just that the Lib Dems have got a bad press, UKIP has been populist and got a lot of support. That doesn't mean that they're going to do better than the Lib Dems. I'm going to make a prediction here. I'm going to say this year, the Lib Dems are going to go from 6,836,000 votes to something like 6 million votes. They're going, to, they're going to suffer badly and they're probably going to lose quite a number of seats. Um, and probably, Ply, uh, sorry not Ply, Conru, UKIP is probably going to get well over the million mark. They might even do very well and get up to 2 million. But I don't think UKIP is going to do better than the Lib Dems because the Gulf at the moment is still well over 5 million. So, you know, it's... UKIP has done well, the Dems have been hammered. That doesn't mean that they're going to automatically become the third party, which in my view is a good thing. But 
think about potential coalition setups here because it is very likely that we're going to have a period in British history of a period of coalitions if last year is anything to go by 2010. So um, let's say the scenario would be the Tories again are the largest party. I think it would be very very difficult for the Lib Dems to go into coalition with them again especially since they're campaigning now as an independent party. Um, and that would be a disaster for the Lib Dems if they have damaged themselves with this government. They would basically just um, commit political suicide by going once again into the Tories. There will be people in the country who are sort of see a bigger picture and think, well, they're doing it for the sake of the country. But what I mean is there will be Lib Dem supporters who will never vote for the party again, even more so than there already are. So I, I can't imagine that Nick Clegg or his party will even think about going into a coalition with the Tories again. Um, I think it's much more likely they would go into coalition with Labour. Therefore, what will the Tories do? Well, the natural choice would be UKIP. But there's no secret that UKIP and the Tories do not get on well. Um, the Tories see UKIP as a threat and UKIP see Tories as sort of like traitors. Because they're not giving them the sort of um, uh, referendum on Europe that they're demanding. Um, and there's been a number of defections from the Tories to UKIP. Um, having said that, the Lib Dems and the Tories were polar opposite parties. Before 2010, they ended up in government together. UKIP and the Tories, on the other hand, have a lot in common. So they might publicly say they disagree. They might publicly say they irritate each other. But I think a coalition is quite plausible. I think that would only be justified if UKIP can demonstrate it is big enough party to be part of a coalition government. Um, otherwise, it's simply undemocratic. I'm not going to say who, which individual party I'll vote for, but I think a good outcome would be Labour Lib Dem. Why? Because you have some of the anti-austerity measures of Labour coming in, which in my view is a good thing. I think the cuts have went way too far. I think there's been far too many divisions in this country. But the Lib Dems will also be there to um, neutralise some of the more hard left Labour policies. Um, so in the end, you would basically have a progressive centre-left government rather than a potentially hard left government. So surely right-wing people, if I mean, obviously they would want a right-wing government to win, but surely they would prefer a Lib Dem Labour coalition rather than an outright Labour government. Um, we are in an era of coalition, so these are all legitimate questions. Now, the most controversial setup of all is the scenario whereby Labour would get into bed with the SNP. Personally, I find this abhorrent. The reason is, I don't think it is feasible that you would have, even as a minority partner, the SNP doing a deal whereby they're getting senior cabinet positions. Look at the scenario. Let's say you have a Labour Prime Minister an SNP Deputy Prime Minister, and potentially, let's say, an SNP Foreign Secretary. You can imagine the scenario. The Prime Minister is pushing one agenda. The SNP Foreign Secretary is pushing another. It would send out mixed messages to countries like Russia. It would make us look weak on the world stage. I really do believe it would. It would weaken the Prime Minister. And I do believe in strong Prime Ministers. I do believe a leader needs to lead from the front. Um... That doesn't mean being arrogant, it doesn't mean being a demagogue, but I do think you need an assertive and powerful Prime Minister. I have no problem with that, actually, because I don't think you need a bureaucrat in number 10. I think you need an assertive decision maker. Um, and it's just the fact that if you have the SNP, which, by the way, is they might have a significant portion of votes in Scotland, but when you look at the UK figures, you know, half a million votes is hardly anything when you add up the total of uh, votes. So if the SNP performs like that again, even if it's big in Scotland, no way would that justify having a position in a UK government. Now, I know the SNP will say, oh, this is undemocratic. Look at the big bully Westminster not letting us have our say. Rubbish. They can have their say in Scottish politics. But why should Nicola Sturgeon be allowed to interfere in English issues, Welsh issues, or Northern Irish issues, when she is demanding... Westminster stays out of Scottish issues. It's profound hypocrisy. Um, and this is a fact. If they form part of a coalition government, they're never going to have any other interests except for Scotland. And if we push it, 
never any other interest except for pushing for Scottish independence. This would be political suicide for the United Kingdom. I know that Jim Murphy, and by the way, Jim Murphy is someone I have a lot of respect for. I believe he campaigned hard in the referendum. I'm very grateful for the work he played in that. But the Labour Party is divided, and he is, I'm just looking at the I newspaper here. It says, Miliband under pressure to rule out post-election deal with Scottish nationalists. But Scottish leader, Labour leader, that's Jim Murphy, blocking move for fear snub could look arrogant. Well, I understand his position. The SNP could use that as ammo against him. But Jim Murphy needs to consider the whole United Kingdom. Now, he's went on record as a unionist. He needs to show it on this occasion to show he's not just thinking about Scotland. Um, because it's very difficult, though, because whether it be the Labour leader or the Lib Dem leader or the Tory leader in Scotland, the SNP now have got them in a position where if they do talk about the wider issues, if they do show concern for the rest of the United Kingdom, they will be dismissed as a traitor to Scotland. That's unfortunately the political environment that the Nationals have created in Scotland. So I do understand Jim Murphy's position, but I disagree with him. I think that um, inviting the SNP into government, it wouldn't silence them, because this idea back in 1997, it was thought, give the Nationals devolution, uh, and not just the Nationals, give the Scottish people devolution, then it will knock uh, any ideas of independence dead. Well, that didn't happen, because we had the referendum. Um, yes, better to get a one, and yes, I'm pleased about that, but it's still, you know, I'm not jubilant about it, because there's still very big divisions going on. So I think, no matter what the scenario, no way should the SNP be put into a coalition government. No way. It would be political suicide, and it would weaken us on the world stage. It may work in some other European countries, but not in a country like the United Kingdom. And the difference is, people might say, well, why, why do you have no problem with the concept of a coalition between the Lib Dems and the Tories? Um, because I have said that I understand they had to make that choice. The difference is, both the Liberal Democrats and the Tories are national parties. They represent the United Kingdom. Even in Scotland, I know the Tories aren't popular, but they do have some fractions of support. And the fact is, they also have support in Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, they have a lot of work to do in terms of getting support in the Celtic nations. But the point is, they are national parties. In fact, in Northern Ireland, um, the Democratic Unionists, their background is actually the Conservative Unionists. So the Tories actually, their sister party, has a lot of history in Northern Ireland, for obvious reasons. I'll say a few final things. I know there's some of my opponents who like to portray me as a sectarian-minded person. To me, sectarian means hatred. It means bigotry. I'm, I don't hate the Scottish Nationalists. I do hate what they represent. And I hate their agenda, which is to divide the United Kingdom. But I try to rise above hating individual people. So, do I hate Nicola Sturgeon? No, I don't. I'm sure politics aside, she's a decent person. But I do hate what she's doing, and I do hate what her party represents. And I make no apology for that. I believe it is entirely natural that one would be interested in preserving their country. I mean, ask an American how they would feel if a major state decided to secede. That's just one analogy. There's many others. I know many friends from around the world who would be horrified at the idea of their country breaking up. So why should the United Kingdom be any different? The United Kingdom is a country. The United Kingdom is a country. And, that, you know, just because people defi defend it doesn't mean that they're sectarian. And unfortunately, because of my accent and the fact I'm from Northern Ireland, it's very easy for people to portray me as Paisley-esque and so on. I have met people from all over the world. I'm well-travelled around the world. I'm a very open-minded person. But I care about my country, and I'm not going to make any apologies for that. Um, another thing I would say is, I just think it would be a disaster for Labour to do that. And if Lib Dem core voters thought their party was treacherous going into bed with the Tories, what on earth would it mean for Labour propping up nationalists? It would be suicide for the United Kingdom. And then Labour would have no right to call itself a unionist party because if they prop up the SNP, that's exactly what they would be doing, propping up a separatist party. I'll leave it there because I'm just going to get worked up in a minute. But That's what I think is going to happen. In terms of my own prediction, 
I don't think I think it will be another coalition. I don't think Miliband, as leader of the Labour Party, will encourage the public enough to vote, no matter how good their policies are. And I'm not saying all their policies are good, but I think Labour might at a push get a higher percentage of votes, but not enough to have enough seats. So they'll have to do a deal with someone, and I hope it would be Lib Dem. Um, of course, I haven't mentioned a Labour Tory deal. That sounds almost unthinkable, because you have quite a left-wing Labour Party at the moment, certainly much more so than the Blair Brown years, and uh, quite a hard-right Tory party, so it seems unthinkable. But, you know, I'm sure people thought the same thing in 19... I think it was 1924, when Ramsay MacDonald joined hands with Stanley Baldwin and they went into the national government. Ever since, the Labour Party has seen MacDonald as something of a traitor, but Tories see him as a pragmatic politician making the right choice, and Stanley Baldwin publicly praised him. So could history repeat um, a Labour-Tory coalition? Um, this might sound bizarre, but in many ways I think that would be a very pragmatic thing. Maybe it's because I'm a centrist person. I know there's many Tories would be horrified at that thought, and many socialists would be horrified at that thought. But being a centrist, I'm quite open-minded to that thought. So actually, for me, the best outcomes would be um, a labour Lib Dem coalition or a Labour-Tory coalition. What I don't want to see is a Labour-SNP coalition, and I don't particularly want to see a um, Conservative-Lib Dem coalition. The reason I think a Conservative-Labour coalition would be better than a Conservative-Lib Dem coalition is because Labour has more radical policies than the Lib Dems, so in that sense they would maybe get more done. than. The, and I think it's difficult for the Lib Dems because they probably have done some progressive things, but that's been overshadowed because they're the junior partner. Anyway... I'll leave it there because I've spoken for long enough, um, but there's a lot of issues to cover. So, British general election 2015, here we come.